This had better be very important, Norman. I have just ruined an 800 guineas suit. That's not matter. We'll both soon be wearing government issue suits with big arrows all over them. Norman, you're touching me. <laughs> Calm down and tell me what the problem is. We've got to get rid of that plutonium oxide in Hull because it is deadly radioactive poison. And you know what that means? Life imprisonment! Beg pardon? <laughs> we are going to knock down the lock-up garage in Pilchard Street Hull. Well, whose idea was it to put the stuff there? Yours! The whole deal was your idea. Storing nuclear waste was going to be a growth industry, you said. Well, I was right, wasn't I? General Galtieri paid us £55,000 to get rid of that tanker full of radioactive sludge. He didn't pay us. He paid you. And then you lumbered me with finding somewhere to put it. Well, there you are, then. It's your fault. <laughs> All right, it's my fault. Now, what are we going to do? Well, we'll move it, of course. Where to? Well, I don't know. We'll find some other lock-up garage in some other rundown labour-controlled inner city. There's plenty of them. <laughs> but we are talking about the most powerful poison known to man. What if something went wrong? I wouldn't be able to live with myself. No. I'd, I'd rather tell the authorities and take my punishment like a man. Yeah, but you're not a man anymore, are you, Norman? <laughs> you're not a proper man, are you? The Norman Borman of 1982 was all for the Argentinian deal, but ever since you've been having that hormone treatment, you've been growing all soft and sentimental. Yes, I admit it. I'm proud to admit it. I'm becoming a woman. <laughs> I'm growing more sensitive. Yes, it's, it's true. Now, what about the nuclear waste? <sighs> well, I'll think of something, Norman. Don't worry. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> oh, Norman, don't cry, please. I can't bear to see a grown transsexual cry. <laughs> Alan! Uh. You're filthy. I'm surprised you can remember, Sarah. It's been such a long time. <laughs> change. Daddy's here. He's staying for a bite to eat. Oh, God. <laughs> Daddy. You fancy a top-up? Is the Pope Polish? <laughs> well, this is a pleasant surprise, Roland. No need to lie, Bastard. You're not in Parliament now. <laughs> you look as though you've been down a coal mine. Oh, this? This is called designer dribbles. It's all the rage in London. <laughs> is it? Wouldn't put it past those metropolitan pansies. Thank you, madame. Well, let's make a start. <laughs> Charcuterie, Daddy. Shark? <laughs> Charcuterie. Cold meats. You know, it's a French word. Oh, French. Might have guessed. You should know I never touch anything French. The last time I touched something French was in 1940. <laughs> Her name was Giselle. I was pissing glass for a month. <laughs> And they say the art of dinner table conversation is dying out. The ham's Danish, actually. Still European, though, isn't it? Mm? Factory farm, saturated with phosphates and hormones, two mouthfuls and you grow tits. That's not sincere, Daddy. French again. I dare say it's 50% vinegar and 50% Jacques Chirac's brilliant team, but I'll give it a try. That was right. It's always such a pleasure when you drop by, Roland. Helps keep me in mind with what people are thinking, to use the word loosely, here in the constituency. If you ever showed your smug little face in this town, you'd know what they were thinking. They're thinking their MP's forgotten where his constituency is. I was elected to serve, um... Halton, Halton Price. Price at Westminster, not to run the local Citizens Advice Bureau. You were elected because you're my son-in-law and I'm the chairman of the local Conservative Party. Don't you forget it. Perhaps you'd like some cheese, Daddy. Oh, yes, do have some fromage. We have plenty of brie or camembert or Paul Lebec. Or some fruit? Yes, a French golden delicious. <laughs> Haven't you got anything South African? <laughs> um, 
I think I've got an outspan grapefruit in the larder. I'll I just go and get it. Now, to the purpose of my visit. Yes, enough of the social pleasantries. The annual village fete will be held next Sunday in my grounds at Ingleborough Hall. Well, it's very short notice, Roland, but uh, luckily I am free. You don't think I'm going to ask you to open the fete, do you? Well, naturally, I am the Member of Parliament. And you'd milk the occasion for tawdry personal profit as you did last year. By the time you'd finished your party political broadcast, it was dark. <laughs> no. We've got Ronald McGill to do the honours. Ronald McGill? You know what else Oh, he's wonderful. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Did you mean to say you were getting some rustic to open the fate instead of me? <laughs> Oh, silly, Alan. Emmerdale Farm's a television programme. Ronald McGill plays Amos Brearley. Mm. Oh, that's jolly exciting, Daddy. Oh, well, thank you for that vote of confidence, Sarah. I remember next time you want to go to London to rape Harrods. Harrods, <laughs> <laughs> if she wants to, you can afford it. Nouveau riche little parvenu like you. Oh, I see. You don't mind using French words when they please, you do. Are they French words? I didn't know that. Bugger if I'll use them again. <laughs> and then, a week after I topped him, some other fella confesses to the murder. <laughs> oh, well, that's the way it goes. You can't make an omelette without breaking necks. <laughs> oh, hello, sir. I was just reminiscing about the good old days. Really? I suppose you consider killing my father-in-law, will you? You know, just to keep your hand in. Cash job. <laughs> oh, Gidley Park's always been a cantankerous old bugger, so you don't want to worry about him. I wouldn't worry about him if he was dead. <sighs> Mind you, hanging's too good for him, really, isn't it? I suppose you could arrange to have him torn limb from limb between two teams of dray horses. It'd be good publicity for the brewery, isn't it? That's very imaginative, sir. I can see you'd have loved it in the good old days when hanging was reserved for minor misdemeanors. Now, your hardened criminals, now they were hung, drawn and quartered. That is to say, sir, they used to hang them up, cut them down while they were still kicking, draw the entrails out of them with hooks, cut the body into four pieces and then stick the head on a pole as a deterrent. <laughs> All that, of course, so was done in public. <laughs> Must have been a lovely day out for the family. <laughs> oh, by the way, sir, if you're eating tonight, the, uh, the special is stuffed hot. Uh, no, thank you, Sidney. I'll just stick to the brandy. Half oh. a mile. Vernon. Hey, you're part. You're Alan Bufton, the Member of Parliament. <laughs> Bastard. When Mr. Bastard is in here, Vernon, he is off duty. Well, if you ask me, he's always off bloody duty. <laughs> so the night my little grandson asked me what mythological meant. Ooh, I said, it's some fabulous non-existent creature like a unicorn. Or our MP, Mr. Bastard. <laughs> I'm terribly sorry about this, sir. Shall I eject him? No, that's all right, Sydney. Let's hear him out. And then throw him out. All right, then, you odiferous little prole. <laughs> You've got one minute. Right. What have you ever done for this constituency? Uh, you or your party? What have I ever done? People have never been so well off. All my friends drive BMWs and they're making a fortune. <laughs> I'm talking about proper industry with proper jobs. I can remember when Britain was the workshop of the world, but you heartless new money Tories don't give a tinker's cuss about manufacturing. That is a baseless slander. I buy British, I drive a Bentley. My <laughs> suits, my shirts and my shoes are all handmade by British craftsmen, albeit with Greek surnames. I'm talking about proper jobs. I can remember when we had the most profitable coal mine in the whole of Yorkshire. A coal mine? Here? Aye, but you wouldn't know that, would you, you Tory Torag? <laughs> Sydney, why don't I know about this coal mine? Oh, well, it closed after the 1926 general strike, sir, and nobody knows to this day why it never reopened. Well, let me get this straight. You're saying that there's a large, unused hole very near here? Oh, well, so they say, sir. <laughs> Where is it? Oh, don't ask me, sir. It's a bit before my time. <laughs> well, who would know then, sir? 
Well, the owner, of course. Well, the general strike was in 1926. Is the owner still alive? Yes, but he wouldn't be if you had your way, sir. It's your father-in-law. <laughs> Are you sure there isn't a spare key to this contraption? Ah. <laughs> well, you look like a chap who could do justice to a single malt. Make that a double single malt. <laughs> <laughs> what have you two been chatting about? Daddy thinks it's high time we started a family. Mm, right you are, father-in-law. We'll get right down to it the moment you leave. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Mud in your eye? A stud? You're after something. No. Just trying to be pleasant. Make up for my appalling behaviour in storming out earlier on. <laughs> Darling, <laughs> I've bought you a present. It's in the garden. No, really? So, uh, Roland, Daddy. <laughs> Good scotch? Yeah, not bad. It's a 25-year-old Glenoddle. <laughs> they only make a couple of thousand cases every sixth year, so really at 63 pounds a bottle, pff, it's a snip. And I was right. You have to be a nouveau riche little parvenu to be able to afford the stuff, huh? <laughs> You know, I've been mulling over your criticisms of my parliamentary profile, and you're right. I've been spending too much time at Westminster and not enough time at my constituency. You know, but start, perhaps you're not quite the unmitigated worm I've always thought. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, wearing my constituency hat, I'd like to ask you why Ingleborough Colliery never reopened after the general strike. Ingleborough Colliery? Yeah, don't you remember? You own it, apparently. Oh! The colliery, oh, that was years ago. General strike. Go on. Well, I was only 21. Father had just died. And the workforce was riddled with communists. So, as the new young master, I had to take um, contingency plans to deal with the threat of revolution. Of course, of course. Uh, but uh, that doesn't explain why the mine never reopened after the strike was crushed. Well, it was a long dispute, you see, and unfortunately mine workings deteriorate rapidly if they're not maintained. So, by the time we'd starved the men back to work, there wasn't any work for them to shuffle back to. <laughs> How funny. Uh, just as a matter of local historical interest, where was the mine, actually? Hereabouts. Uh, whereabouts, exactly. Why don't you concentrate on Westminster and stop poking your nose into local affairs? Um, I can't find my present. Oh, there wasn't one. It was a joke. Ha ha. <laughs> quite curvaceous. Thank you, darling. And you can cut that right out. I hope to, in due course. And when I'm a woman, the authorities won't be able to touch me. Unless they ask me nicely. <laughs> Look, I've located the mine on this old map. Now, I've checked the 1982 version, and there doesn't seem to have been any building above the mine. Splendid. Of course, we ought to contact the county council, see if there's been development in the last few years. Oh, yes, that's a good idea, yes. And then we could issue a press release, couldn't we, saying that Alan Bastard, MP, is about to dump a thousand gallons of radioactive slurry in an area of designated natural beauty. Sorry, darling. Come on, let's get going. We've got a long drive ahead of us. Get off! Oh.
gonna need the serious bolt cutters. And <laughs> you. Yeah. Well, Nuke the gates, I suppose. We can't dump it here. Why not? Because the mine runs under a school. That's why not. You can't dump nuclear fuel under an infant school. It's only a council school. <laughs> British people have just voted for an independent nuclear deterrent, then they should be proud to have British nuclear waste under their schools. But this is not nuclear waste. Well, then, it's probably less radioactive. I mean, the art is not as sufficient as we are, are they, Norman? <laughs> no! I'm sorry, Alan, but I draw the line. You are on your own! You walk out on me now, Norman Borman, and you can whistle for the money for the rest of your sex change. Well, I don't suppose I need your money anymore. The gamma rays coming off this truck. I wouldn't be at all surprised if I changed species, let alone gender. Go on, be reasonable. This job doesn't call for reason. This calls for a mindless psychopath. Right. <laughs> Mind if I wasn't paying the bill by the hour. Oh, hello, sir. Come in, come in. I, uh, I'm afraid I can't sell you a drink, sir, or else I should get into hot water with the licensing magistrates. But then, of course, you'd know that being one. Oh, stop gibbering, right? Sydney. I know you spend every afternoon in the company of Gina, busty Eurasian masseurs. <laughs> it's nothing to be ashamed of, isn't it? Well, no, of course not. The girl's self-employed. She's doing a bit for Britain instead of lying around in bed all day. But she does lie around in bed all day. <laughs> so it's not her bed, is it? Oh. <laughs> now, Sidney, hmm? I am going to confide in you. Are you? Oh, thank you, sir. Now, really, what I'm going to tell you shouldn't be known by anyone who hasn't signed the Official Secrets Act. Oh, but I have signed it, sir. All us official executioners had to. Did you? Oh, good. Well, then I can tell you. The Prime Minister has decided that the next vote on capital punishment will not be a free vote. Oh, but that's wonderful, sir. That really is fantastic <laughs> news. <laughs> what does it mean, actually? <laughs> well, Sydney, it means that this time next year, the prison population is going to start to drop <laughs> very sharply. <laughs> I you get mean, my drift. You mean I'll get my old job back? Who do you think is going to be the Minister for Death? You, sir. Oh, congratulations. Thank you, Sydney. <laughs> so stick by me. And it'll be money for old rope. <laughs> ah. Now then, uh, coincidentally, Sydney, there's a little something that you could do for me. dumping beer in a disused coal mine. <laughs> Unless, of course, it isn't beer. <laughs> I can see you're not as stupid as you look, Sydney. Oh, thank you, sir. So, let me just say that what I don't tell you, the Russians can't torture out of you. Got you, sir. Right, Sydney, this is the plan. You shin down the ladder. I'll go and get the barrels of beer, drop them down to you, you catch them, and do the necessary. I'm not going down there, sir, not even for you. Why on earth not? I'm afraid of death, sir. <laughs> afraid of what? Depths, sir. Some people are afraid of heights. I'm afraid of depths. That's why all the barrels in my pub, sir, are under the counter so that I don't have to go down into the cellar. You're mad, aren't you? <laughs> well, uh, more you're neurotic rather than your psychotic, sir. My psychotherapist says that it's all my subconscious guilt because of having to prepare all those people for the long drop. All right, all right, I'll do it myself. But I'm warning you, when the death penalty bill comes up for its third reading, I'm going to table an amendment in favour of the electric chair. Oh, but you can't do that, sir. I don't know my AC from my DC. Just get the barrels, Sydney. You're not afraid of barrels, are you? Uh, uh -huh.
Danger. Mustard gas. Deadly poison. Best before December 1927. <laughs> As I told you, I had to make contingency plans against the threat of revolution. But for £55,000, that's what the Argus paid you, isn't it? I'll show you my disused quarry. Roland Gidley Park. You're a bigger bastard than I am. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs>